Communism, probably one of the most debated forms of government in this world's existence. As most of you know, the U.S. fought a 44-year war with the Soviet Union over communism. And most people also know the negative effects of communism as most of the Soviets, the lower class was left in poverty, was famished, uh, and was forced to work in camps called gulags. But most people don't know about a smaller country. Even though this country was a lot smaller than the Soviet Union, they had a leader. Not just any leader, a leader who most people say had the most tyrannical and brutal rule in a country's history. We're talking about Pol Pot. Before we get to the video, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you so much for the support. Um, definitely drop a like because it took me a long time to write this script. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone for the support. But without further ado, let's get into Pol Pot. Pol Pot was born Salat Sar in 1925 in the small village of... I'm trying to get these pronunciations right. So if I look at it, it says Prek Sabav, about 100 miles north of the Cambodian capital of Phnom Penh. Um, he was born to a wealthy family who actually owned 50 acres of rice paddy. In 1934, he actually moved to the capital to go to a Buddhist monastery before he went to a French Catholic school. He continued to study until 1949, studying radio technology in France and ultimately becoming involved in multiple communist circles. And by the time he came back to Cambodia, this is 1953, in the midst of their revolt against French rule, which they did gain independence that year. In 1951, Pol joined the KPRP, which is the Khmer People's Republic Party, uh, in 1960, he actually reorganized the principles of the KPRP. Um, they became a party that actually supported Marxism and Leninism. I'm mean, going to have some bubbles about Marxism and Leninism around somewhere on the screen. But also in 1963, there was a crackdown on communism by the Cambodian government. So him and his group members went into hiding in the woods to avoid being captured. While in the woods, they found solace with a group of Viet Cong members. Pol Pot managed to emerge as the leader of this group. And the new Khmer Rouge guerrilla army, they started a national uprising in 1968. In March 1970, General Lan No started a military coup while the Prince Norodom Sihanouk was out of Cambodia. Prince Norodom sided with the Khmer Rouge while Lan No received United States backing. As you might expect, this caused a civil war in Cambodia, and it all came to a head when both of these groups committed a, a massive atrocities, where about 70,000 American and Southeastern Vietnamese soldiers attacked bases that contained Khmer Rouge and Viet Cong military. Also, there was a fun fact. During the Vietnam War, President Nixon ordered secret bombings. Over half a million tons of bombs were dropped during the Vietnam War, and this is almost three times as much that were actually dropped during World War II. So that's, most people don't even know that they were dropping bombs in Vietnam. But by 1973, the Khmer Rouge controlled three-fourths of Cambodia, and they too were bombing the Cambodia as well. Uh, the Khmer Rouge also bombarded hospitals and river crossings. This prevented airlifts that would prevent millions of children from starving. So these children were not able to get the food, airdrops that they were that they could they so desperately needed but can the Khmer Rouge won the war this is not even the tip of the iceberg of how evil that they can get though um after gaining power after the civil war victory Pol Pot became the in effect the leader of Cambodia so he renamed the country Democratic Kampuchea and he actually stripped the statuses of like professional workers, like doctors, lawyers, civil engineers, he stripped them of their professional status and forced them to work in the rice paddy fields. He also abolished money and forced the citizens to wear the exact same black clothing. And anyone who was an opponent to Pol Pot's rule was killed, as most of these people were forced to work without pay in the rice paddy fields several hours a day. There was also an infamous detention center called S21 where thousands of people were tortured and killed. And you know, they deemed a lot of people bad elements because they were against 
the rule of Pol Pot. So these people were in fact eliminated and tortured in these camps. One of the common statements used by the Khmer Rouge during this time was, to keep you is no profit and to destroy you is no loss. As it was so many people being killed that they were using dead bodies as fertilizers in the rice paddy. In 1976, a new constitution was started to where the state owned the means of production. They declared men and women equal and they also had an obligation for all citizens to work. Uh, sports were prohibited. Citizens could only read government produced papers. Uh, travel was only allowed with the permission of the Khmer Rouge. And you know they wasn't letting people go anywhere. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge actually wanted Prince Norodom Sihanouk to come back and be a part of the leadership in Cambodia, but he was actually uncomfortable and he resigned from his position as head of state in March of 1976. Once Pol Pot became the Cambodian Prime Minister, he actually started to classify people based on their religious backgrounds, establishing what is called state atheism. He basically eliminated all types of religions. And as you know, Cambodia is primarily a Buddhist country, so the Buddhist monks were declared social parasites and were actually forced to work in the paddy fields as well. Pol Pot had a bunch of architectural type goals for Cambodia, but the thing is he didn't have any experienced workers because he stripped all of the experienced workers of their statuses so they can work in the fields. So it was several projects that it couldn't start because nobody really knew what to do. Like several bridges, several buildings that didn't, were not finished because the workers simply did not have the, the experience necessary to complete these projects. Um, they, they banned foraging, they banned hunting for your own food. There were things called communal kitchens where everyone in a community ate together, like everyone ate together. You couldn't eat in your own house. Um, the people who were in charge of giving the food were very lazy. So there were actually three, there were actually food shortages in over three fourths of Cambodia by the end of 1976. But there were members of the Khmer Rouge who still had access to these quality foods. There were people who were getting imports from other countries, people who were buying high, high value luxury products. There were people of the, the higher class who were also receiving medical treatment, like top notch medical treatment, while three fourths of the country is in a famine and poor. However, there were several attempts to try to stop the Khmer Rouge government as by 1976, there were various members of his party and Vietnamese members who were trying to stop the Khmer Rouge and there was so many arrests. And the fact, in fact, the government actually started invent, inventing, making up face, fake assassination claims so that they could justify the amount of people that they were arresting based on like collusion and that they thought people were trying to stop the community from within. Like these people were encouraged to confess. Like they would torture them for hours and they would make them confess even though they haven't done anything wrong. Um, they had to literally confess in public in front of everybody. Like they were read out. Like they had to read the confessions in public in meetings in front of the whole community. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about S21, the kind of infamous detention center, this was actually a secondary school that was converted into a torture chamber, basically, for all those who opposed Pol Pot. Um, by, by the first half of the year, 400 people were sent. By the second half, that number was close to 1,000. By 1977, where 1,000 people were being sent to the torture chamber every month. It's been said that at least 15 to 20,000 people have been sent to the torture chambers to either be killed or actually just tortured into confessing whatever crime they did. Also, a fun fact, Pol Pot actually never saw S21 in person. He never visited. He never visited the center. So these, all this stuff was going on without him watching. Uh, by 1978, the Khmer Rouge did another purge of Cambodian citizens. It's not even the first purge. Tens of thousands of Vietnamese sympathizers, of, or so they thought, were killed. Like, the remaining members of the Communist Party of Kampuchea were also killed, even with their children. So it was just like, Pol Pot could really sense the writing of the wall. I think he knew that 
his rule was coming to an end shortly and he starts getting to the point where he's back into a corner and he can't trust anybody. So if you even look like you sympathize with Vietnam, you're getting killed. And this is really where they messed up. This is really what doomed Pol Pot. Uh, by 1976, he believed that Vietnam was a threat to Cambodian independence because they kept expanding. So they attacked Vietnam in 1977. They killed several hundred civilians and Vietnam responded by bombing Cambodian border positions. <laughs> and here's one of the funniest parts that I did during my research. Pol Pot, in order to try to draw support from the Cambodian citizens during this forced war that he didn't even have to start, there were plans of a cult, like a, a evolving around Pol Pot. There, he was trying to get the citizens to join some type of cult so they can so, so they would just be his loyal servants during the war. Like he would put large photos of him in the kitchens where the communal kitchens where everyone was eating together. There were paintings of him in the dining halls, uh, in the in the oil paintings. There was there was like statues of him. But unfortunately, this, this cult never actually got his feet off the ground. But I just wanted to say that because that was a funny idea. Like, he was trying to get people to be one under him so they could support this forced war effort that really didn't even need to happen. As this war effort started to look really bad for Cambodia, the troops had very... The, the troops had a lot of difficulties breaking through the Vietnamese defenses. And Pol Pot became very suspicious of this because I guess he thought that they were working for the Vietnamese. So he ordered another purge. 400 troops, all 400 troops that were sent to the Eastern Zone were supposed to be killed. And now, now that they knew that they were going to be killed, they began rebelling against the government. So Pol Pot sent more troops to defeat the people, to try to kill the people that were trying to rebel against them in the first place. So it was just a never revolving. Oh wait, oh. You're gonna revolt? Oh, we're gonna send some more people to kill you. We're gonna we're gonna send people to kill our own troops. Cause they revolt. <laughs> yes, we're gonna send people to kill our own troops. Uh, by 1978, it was pretty clear that Vietnam was just gonna come in and just invade Cambodia full scale. So Pol Pot was trying to draw, draw support from the other neighboring countries like Thailand and and Singapore and China. But the thing is like some a country like especially China, a country with a lot of like global superpower, um, they actually agreed with his position, but they didn't feel like sending troops to attack Vietnam would be the best because you got to think this is still the height of the Cold War, and fighting with Vietnam might trigger something with the Soviet Union, and we know the state of the Soviet Union during the late seventies, so. China was like, hey, we're not going to start anything. We're not going to send any troops because we don't want to, we don't want a, a war with the Soviet Union at all. On Christmas of all days of 1978, Vietnam launched their full scale invasion. And the, the Cambodia was, they weren't ready. Like all of the troops flee, not all the troops. Actually, Pol Pot and all the higher ups were actually in Thailand before this. So, the troops at the guarding the stations were left to fend for themselves. Like all of the inmates in the detention center S21, they were actually ordered to be killed before the Vietnamese even came and captured the compound. So the, these troops had no idea how big the force that Vietnam was coming with. So their defenses were highly unorganized and they just weren't ready. And the Vietnamese actually took over and established a new government in Cambodia they called it the People's Public, the People's Republic of Campuchia. However, Pol Pot was actually in discussions with China, and China actually did attack Vietnam in order to try to draw Vietnamese troops out of Cambodia. And surprisingly, regardless of all the, the really foul stuff they've done, the Khmer Rouge received support from several non-Marxist Southeast, Southeast Asian countries even the United States because at this time they feared that the Vietnamese like aggression would influence the Soviets to be aggressive as well. December of 1969 
Uh, Pol Pot actually stepped down as Prime Minister of Cambodia and was replaced by Kiyu Samphan. This actually allowed Pot to focus fully on the war effort and also trying to improve the image of the Khmer Rouge because most people now, they, they think the, the Khmer Rouge has some brutal, murdering, communist, like, one-party state government, you know. During this time, like, the Khmer Rouge does a whole 180. So they're literally trying to denounce everything that they stood for in the 60s and 70s. So now it's the senior members begin to denounce the socialism even though they literally just stripped everyone of their ability to work and made everyone work in the same place, made everyone wear the same clothing, abolished money. Work. I, oh, I didn't, I didn't say it. They took children away under the age of seven, they took children away from the homes. For what reason? I don't know. They took children out of people's homes. They abolished sexual activity, like socialist to the core. So you denying socialism is just like a, okay. But many young Cambodian men actually joined the war in a way to try to draw the Vietnamese out of their country. It seemed that Pol Pot's talk with the Chinese actually helped because they got a lot of support for their military and they were rebuilding it up pretty good by the early 80s and even to a bigger surprise the communist party of Campuchia was dissolved in the early 80s and there was a the, they ended the communal kitchens there was a ban the ban on individual possessions was lifted uh, children were again allowed to live with their parents <laughs> crazy but Pot's health actually started to decline as in 1983 he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease during a checkup. But even worse, next year Vietnam, the Vietnamese attacked again, forcing Pol Pot to go back to Thailand to flee. Alright, so this is really where everything kind of falls apart for the Khmer Rouge. This is where everything falls apart. This is where Pol Pot's lifetime legacy is just destroyed so as you know in the early 90s the berlin wall was tore down and the soviet union collapsed the end of communism the end of the threat of communism the global the end of the global threat of communism so once all this stuff happened the u.s didn't even see the soviet union as a threat so they didn't care about whether Viet the Vietnamese were attacking Cambodia at this point because now they're not going to trigger Russia because Russia is done now, you know what I'm saying? So now they, they didn't even recognize Democratic Kampuchea as the official government of Cambodia. Uh, there was a ceasefire between Cambodia and Vietnam during this time. And in a change of heart, Prince Sihanouk actually sided with the Vietnamese leaders. This is the former leader of Cambodia. <laughs> and he also said that the leaders of the Khmer Rouge should be put to death for all of the horrible things that they did in the country. However, Kiyu Sanfan said, we're not gonna disarm our troops if there are still Vietnamese soldiers occupying the country. So the Khmer Rouge became kind of confrontation, confrontational during this time and they, started to expand more during Cambodia and, Cambodia and their killings got even more. They started killing more people as a revolt to this Vietnamese occup occupation of their country. And as you would think, the Vietnamese forces led by Hun Sen, they retaliated and to the point where the peacekeepers from the UN couldn't even stop what they were doing. And by this time, Prince Sinuk said, Cambodia is not ready for any type of democratic elections due to the amount of violence in this country. In 1994, a new Vietnamese-backed government came into Cambodia to take over, so they still were launching more attacks against the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot. Pol Pot. That name is kind of that name kind of like a tongue twister. He had to flee to Thailand again in 1994. Um, he knew the Khmer Rouge was falling apart. So he, or he confiscated private transport and also ended cross-border trade with Thailand. He also ordered the execution of a British Frenchman 
and an Australian who were captured on the train during an attack from the Khmer Rouge. So he was definitely losing it. Like, he knew that the writing was on the wall. He knew that his time was coming up. He knew that he didn't have much time left. He knew that people were coming. And also, his health was steadily declining even more during this time. After, as now he suffered from a condition called aortic stenosis. No longer had access to the treatment for the cancer he had as well. And he was paralyzed on the left side of his body from a stroke. And he required daily access to oxygen. So his health is failing him right now. During the like during the the really late 90s, this is really like the end of Pol Pot, like not just his life, but just his like just his rule. And the thing is, he was still the barbaric tyrant until he died. Like in 1997, for some reason, he grew suspicious of Sun Sen, one of the leaders on his Khmer Rouge government, and he ordered his assassination. People from the Khmer Rouge killed Sun Sen and 13 of his family members. Uh, Tay Mok, who was another member of the, the Khmer Rouge, he was kind of concerned that Pol Pot would kill him as well since he killed another member of his own party. So he sent his troops to go arrest him, and they actually put him on house arrest in 1997. So his last interview was conducted by an American journalist named Nate Thayer. Um, hopefully, I'll have a clip of this interview that I'll put in, but I'm just going to read the excerpt. He said that his, co his conscience was clear, but he also says he made mistakes and told Thayer that I want you to know that everything I did, I did for my country. He also rejected the idea that millions had died during his rule. To say that millions died is too much and that you know for the other people, you know for the other people, the babies, the young ones, I did not order them to be killed. Uh, were you responsible for tool slaying and do you really believe that those 16,000, including women and children, were agents of a foreign government? <laughs> ແລະສໍາຄັນສໍາຄັນທີ່ແລະອັນກໍພິມພ້ອມກັນ <coughs> ពួកអនុមកក្រុមនេះគេចាត់តាំងគណៈ so, in July 1998, Pol Pot was actually sentenced to life imprisonment while three of his other comrades were sentenced to death for their war crimes. The circumstances around Pol Pot's death were kind of fishy because he, he died in his sleep of heart failure in, in, in uh, April 15th of 1998. But Thayer actually believes that he committed suicide by ingesting a cyanide pill upon finding out that Tay Monk was going to turn him over to the United States. He was going to try to get him extradited to the United States to face his actual life sentence. So the circumstances around his death are kind of cloudy. But ladies and gentlemen, that is the story of the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot, one of the most heinous dictators in world, really world history. Trying to force a one party government on people and I think his downfall was when he started to, when he attacked Vietnam. Like, if you would have left Vietnam alone, maybe his empire would have stood up. Because he had support from the United States. Like, he had support. 
he had support from a lot of other countries. But once he attacked Vietnam, and Vietnam attacked, kept attacking him back, and then he started killing people who were opposed opposed to him, that's where I feel like it, it fell off, you know. But again, I thank you so much for the support. I appreciate y'all for watching this video. This script took me so long to write, bro. Like, if I edit all the cuts, if you see a lot of cuts, it's because I'm trying to edit, I'm trying to, I'm looking at the script, and I'm like, I was studying the script, but I had to look at it like I'm fumbling my words. But thank you so much. I appreciate all the support. Definitely drop a like. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate all of you, bruh. Drop a like. It took me a long time to make this script. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's, there's this, like, super thanks button. I think it's, like, some type. It's, like, kind of like a super chat. I don't know. But, you know what I'm saying? If you if you want to. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't ever want to make you do nothing you don't want to do. But if you want to support me like that. And that's always open. There's always a super chat on because this is going to be a, a premiere as well. But I appreciate y'all so much. And uh, thank you for the support. Um, please be safe. Stay on the grind. I'm out. Peace.